The isolated and windswept gothic seaside town of Whitby in Yorkshire is celebrating 125 years of Dracula. Myths of the undead bring in thousands of visitors each year. But how are the living in Whitby protecting their traditional way of life? The ancient seaside town of Whitby lies on the North Yorkshire coast, divided by the River Esk and dominated by the Abbey ruins, which date back to the 12th century. With its agricultural, geological and literary charms, it's been a magnet for visitors for generations. Especially this year, which marks the 125th anniversary of the publication of Bram Stoker's Dracula, a novel partly inspired by Whitby landmarks, events and folklore. I'm going to be getting in touch with my inner goth to celebrate the occasion. I'll be meeting the people of Whitby who work and protect its coastline today. And taking a deep dive into our archives of coastal Britain. So I get right in? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, dear, this is hard work. I'll be discovering the secrets of a historic Whitby treat. There's a right way, a wrong way, and a Whitby way. <laughs> we meet the gemologist, Sarah Steele, who's fighting to give Whitby Jet its rightful place in gemology. This is actually a world-class gemstone here on our doorstep in North Yorkshire. A very special old lady is being given a makeover by the RNLI. She's a beautiful looking boat. Probably the, the Rolls Royce of rowing lifeboats. And as Countryfile goes to the seaside, I'm plundering the archives for some coastal favourites. I have never seen lobster larvae before, and they are absolutely tiny. Like the time Anita went on a rescue mission in Northumberland. Good luck. Be free. Off they go. This setting for Dracula has been a place of pilgrimage for literary and gothic fans ever since the Victorian novelist Bram Stoker came here on a rainy family holiday back in 1890. In 2018, Whitby Abbey Museum acquired a rare first edition of Dracula, signed by Bram Stoker. And I have the privilege of getting my hands on it. Hello, Susan. Hello. Susan Harrison is a curator with English Heritage and looks after the Abbey's artefacts. So this is the first edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula from the 1890s? Yes, definitely. Can I have a hold? How special is it? It's unique. There are a number of first editions, but the fact that it is signed by Stoker makes it incredibly special to us to display it here at Whitby Abbey. Miss, I can't read that, Mulligan? Yes. With Bram Stoker's very kind remembrance, 7th of February, 1901. Wow. He, he didn't have very good writing, did he? Not that neat, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Bram Stoker was a Dublin-born writer who earned his living as a personal assistant to actor Sir Henry Irving and as a manager of the Lyceum Theatre in London's West End. Everybody knows the story of Dracula. When it was first published, was it successful? It wasn't successful, no, and it wasn't successful in Stoker's lifetime. Mm. But since his death, it's actually never been out of print since. Gosh, I mean, he'd be turning in his grave with, with joy, knowing that we all know about this. Or frustration. 100 years on, yeah, or frustration. Hopefully he's not coming out of his grave in, in the Dracula style. Bram Stoker's book went on to spawn many films, including this 1931 Hollywood classic. I am Dracula. With Bela Lugosi. And the 1958 Hammer Horror movie with Christopher Lee. It was after the 1931 film became a huge success that the book itself started to really take off. And Whitby gained cult status as a key setting in the novel. 
And today it's more popular than ever. With thousands of fans visiting Whitby for Goth Weekend every April and October. So, why is this book, um, Bram Stoker, uh, connected so closely with Whitby? So, Stoker visited Whitby on holiday in 1890, and some of the things that he observed and some of the things he read and learnt about in Whitby, he incorporated into Dracula. He went to a, a town library and he discovered um, the name of the main character, Vlad the Impaler, also called Dracula. When reading a book in the library? When reading a book in the library, yeah. So we have Dracula leaves the ship in the shape of a black dog, and that's vested in lore and legend of Whitby, of the Barguest, the black dog, along the coast here. Strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up from the deck below and running forward jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, it disappeared in the darkness. Whilst here, Stoker would have learned of a shipwreck that occurred five years earlier, just below the abbey here. And it was a shipwreck of a, um, a ship called the Dimitri, a collier ship, and that inspired his ship, the Demeter. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes, the lately glassy sea was like a roaring, devouring monster. And there was a shudder amongst the watchers as they realized the terrible danger in which the schooner now was. What is it about Whitby and the supernatural? I think it's about spirituality. It's about how you approach Whitby from the moors. You see this fantastic landscape ahead of you. You see the ruins of Whitby Abbey on the headland. But the town itself is amazing. It's the topography of it, the geography of it. It's got lots of alleyways, passages, and you just want to explore. And when you spot the abbey on the headland from that distance, you're drawn to it. You want to go and see what that's about. Yeah, I, I certainly felt it when I first arrived. It's a suitably dramatic day to discover why Bram Stoker thought Whitby was the perfect place for vampire Count Dracula to visit in the novel. Susan, this is a spectacular building. But it's in ruins. Why is that? The Benedictine Abbey that you see here today was founded in the 11th century, and a lot of the buildings were put up in the 12th century, and the East End was rebuilt in the 13th century. But it comes down to when Henry VIII suppressed the monasteries in 1539 here, and the site needed to be rendered useless for religious worship, so the roof was stripped off. That left the shell of the building that gradually deteriorated and that has left what we see, these iconic skeletal remains of the ruins now. Skeletal remains, I, I like that. Uh, but that's what gives it this sort of eerie feel. Like, I can imagine being here in the dark and, you know, it would lend itself to a novel like Dracula. Definitely. Yeah. And the town, that's where he would have got the inspiration from the boat that was, was grounded, that Russian boat, the Dimitri. So this is actually a really good place to be Talking about Dracula and, and the influences on Bram Stoker. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's nice in the sun with a bit of wind, but I can imagine on a you know in a few hours' time when the sun goes down, it feels quite creepy here. It's very atmospheric. Atmospheric, maybe yeah, that's better. Very, <laughs> very spiritual place. Mm. From one ancient seaside town to another. While Bram Stoker was here in Whitby, he may well have popped into Botham's, the bakery behind the Whitby Lemon Bun, a speciality dating back 150 years. From humble beginnings, Botham's now employs 120 in the family's bakeries, shops and tea rooms. Traditional Yorkshire brack, plum bread and ginger biscuits are part of their repertoire but it's their Whitby lemon bun that some say is in the pantheon of baked goods. Joe Botham, managing director and craft baker. Joe, you look busy there. You can help me if you like. There's a hairnet for you. Uh, 
Put that on. I don't look good in hair nets. <laughs> Is the latest in a long line of bottoms in the business. So what's going in there? The flour and the liquid and the yeast and a few other ingredients that we like to keep secret. Ah. Uh, we'll be ready to make some lemon buns. So you mentioned this secret ingredient. What is it? Well, it's not really a secret ingredient as much as a secret recipe. Ah. Closely guarded. I see. I was just wondering whether it was sort of the bottom's love that you were putting into it, and that was well, the secret it's ingredient. Well, it's a bit of everything, isn't it, you know? Carrying it like you're carrying a baby. Yeah, well, it is. It is. Can I get it right in? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, dear, this is, this is like hard work. That's oh, yeah. it. On the balance scale. The business all started with a rather remarkable woman. 150 years or slightly more. Started by my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Botham, in 1865. Yeah, that's right. 1865? Yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't seem possible. Are you sure you've missed out, you've missed out a few greats in there? That's a long time ago. Well, it, it, it passed to her children. She had 10 babies over a period of 14 years wow. and started the business from scratch at the same time. And superwoman. Yeah, a real tough businesswoman. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what do you think she'd say if she was looking down on you now, still running the business? <laughs> she'd say, get on with that, because you're still talking <laughs> and say, not working. Fire that guy, Sean Fletcher. He's rubbish. <laughs> Back in 1865, 25 years before Bram Stoker came to Whitby on holiday, Elizabeth Botham began selling her now historic Whitby lemon buns from a basket in the local market. The business grew alongside the coffee houses that became popular in Victorian times. The fact that Bram Stoker came to Whitby, I mean, he could have come here and tried your lemon buns, an, an earlier version of them. He certainly could. Maybe it was something that he thought Dracula could get his teeth into. <laughs> it's a bit, I've got a bit of a horror show here. It's doing OK. It's, all right. it's getting there. Yeah. But there, there's something about Whitby that is quite spiritual and quite... Um, I can see how it could inspire a writer. When the mist comes in, very, very atmospheric, and um, down by the harbour, yeah, I think it can be a pretty spooky sort of place. Many buns have gone through this, this oven, haven't they? Yeah, about 1964, so it's actually a bit older than I am, this oven. Eight minutes now, and we really need to switch the timer on, otherwise we'll be in trouble. Burnt buns, <laughs> but we're going to get perfect buns. In order to support her many children, Elizabeth sold homemade bread and cakes to make ends meet. So, Lois, you're the, the expert icer, are you? Lois is part of the fifth generation of the family in the business. Gosh, I suppose it, it is important that you keep this going, isn't it? We've had several generations. We've had people who've met and married working at Botham's. We're really sort of knitted into the fabric of the community, right? A workplace, a dating agency, guys. It's, yeah. it's got everything, <laughs> isn't it? Well, so what do I need to do then? So we're just going to take the top off the piping bag. We're going to hold it vertically and keep the seam on this side, uh, just so the shape comes out right. OK. And then you hold it on top, squeeze it on, and just flick it up, just so it doesn't pull away. I mean, you're making it look easy, I'm sure. Oh, and very quick as well. Just a bit closer. Yes, I feel like I'm in a bit of a bun fight here. You're doing absolutely fabulously. Well done. You're not going to be able to sell these, <laughs> I think. But it's, uh, do you foresee sort of taking on the business in the future or playing, you know, the part that Joe's playing yeah, now? Yeah, we want to. We want to continue in the bakery, definitely. And then passing that down to your children in the next generation and all that. We'll see. Mine are only ten and eight, so it's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can you can start to indoctrinate them now, can't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Get them in to do some strawberry tarts. <laughs> Quite nice good. There you go. Uh, there you go. Oh. That was a perfect one. Can I have one of those rejects that I've made? You can have a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to this. Oh, they there look go. great, don't they? Now, there is a very important ritual involved in eating these buns that only codheads, Whitby slang for locals, would know. I mean, I'm, my mouth is watering. Good. It's, I'm... So it should be. But there's one thing you need to tell me. How do you eat? A Whitby lemon bun. Well, we always say there's a right way, a wrong way, 
and a Whitby way. The right way, I suppose, is just to eat it. The wrong way would definitely be to, <laughs> you know, risk losing your icing. But the Whitby way. Oh, neatly done. So That's it's like a sort of way. icing sandwich. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. oh, I like this. And what better place to have a Whitby lemon bun than here on the coast? Perfect setting. Keeping the sea well stocked with fish and seafood is vital for all of us. Anita hatched a plan with... Whitby Jet, beloved by morning Victorians and weekend goths alike, is famously the local gemstone. But as it's become more scarce, the market for fakes is posing a real threat to this 180 million year old jewel of Whitby. It's an early low tide here on Whitby Beach. And on mornings like this, you'll see jeweler and gemologist Sarah Steele hunting for jet washed up on the shore. To me, it's amuletic, it's talismanic. There is a magic to jet. Jet is fossilised wood formed over millions of years. Due to its high carbon content, it is extremely dark, which inspired the term jet black. Jet has been found in Dorset, but Whitby is the jet capital of the UK. So ideally, we would come out every low tide if we could. But in reality, most of my time is either spent in the workshop making the jewellery or doing my research. But I try and come out once a week or so, depending on weather. Jet has played a significant role in Whitby for the last five and a half thousand years. Back then, the dead were buried with the gemstone, supposedly in the belief it would protect them in the afterlife or as a status symbol. And with materials like this, often there is rituals involved. So even today, when we collect jet, we have to undergo the same rituals as those people in the Neolithic. So our collection is governed entirely by the tide and the moon. You've got to have an in-depth knowledge of the tides. If not, the tide may come in, you may drown. So it's a perilous occupation. I'll have a rake through that small amount of water. Maybe this one it isn't quite as treacherous. George IV declared Jet the official morning gem for the British Empire. And the Victorians couldn't get enough of it. At its peak, there were around 200 jet factories in Whitby. Oh my God, what is that? I thought it was a bit of a dog bone. But it's not the easiest stone to spot. So normally the jet's very light, so it washes in with the tide. So on a normal day, there would be lots of seaweed on this beach, and we go through the seaweed looking for any black materials that we find. There's lots of black materials on Whitby Beach, um, but the jet's quite distinctive once you know what you're looking for. I've been collecting jets since I was seven. Many of the children here in Whitby are an absolute expert at doing this. Probably the most amazing thing about the jet industry here in Whitby and how we work it today as a cottage industry is that we can actually find our raw material, a world-class gemstone, less than a few hundred yards from our workshops. So we can come down here, we can pick up the material, take it back, cut, shape and polish it, and that makes jet one of the most ethical gem industries on Earth right now. It has a very low carbon footprint. So I've had the shop here for 12 years in Whitby. Now we have three generations working jet in our family. And many of the shops here in Whitby, they're third, fourth generation jet workers. So we're really continuing the tradition here in Whitby. With its links to mourning, jet waned after the death of Queen Victoria. But it's making a comeback, and not just with goths. We're enjoying a resurgence in popularity. People come from all around the world to buy our jet material. But Sarah is concerned that genuine Whitby jet is under threat. It's important that we can protect our industry. 
Some of the other jet communities elsewhere in the world are really struggling with other materials coming in from China and Russia that are sold as indigenous jets. So I'm trying to build the databases we need to actually champion Whitby Jet, protect our materials so we can prove our material is from Whitby here. In something that's black and opaque, like jet, all the wavelengths of visual light that fall on it are absorbed by the structure of the jet. So we don't see anything. Essentially, it's jet black. That's where the same jet black comes from. So I'm using different wavelengths of energy, things like infrared, ultraviolet. I'm even looking at the isotopes within the jet to see if we can actually see anything using those wavelengths of light that we can't see with our eyes. I've handled probably millions of pieces of jet in my career. And if I see something in an artifact that I've never seen in the natural material, then I've got a pretty good idea that that material isn't jet. If Sarah can win her battle to identify authentic jet, ancient Whitby jet could face a bright future. For a very long time, it's really been treated as a seaside trinket, a tourist product. This is actually a world-class gemstone here on our doorstep in North Yorkshire. Um, and we really need to champion this as a gemstone. It's so much more than a tourist product. It still is culturally important to these people here in Whitby. My son Archie has a degree in fine jewellery and silversmithing. He's not followed me as a geologist, um, so he's from a real jewellery background. So it's really good to have new blood with new ideas and uh, new techniques coming into the family business and still cutting the jet here. It has, after all, been 180 million years in the making, so this material hopefully will go on to be important to the members of my family for years to come. Traditional local crafts are helping keep our seaside economy alive. Here in Whitby, Dracula's UK home, lifeboats crewed by volunteer locals have been helping those in trouble at sea since 1802. The Whitby Lifeboat Museum is on the site of a double boathouse used by the RNLI since the 1950s. They've recently acquired a 103-year-old Victorian lifeboat, the kind that would have been used in Bram Stoker's day. Neil Williamson, Whitby Lifeboat Museum curator and former lifeboat crew volunteer, is busy bringing her back to her former glory and ready for the public. Hello, Neil. Hello, Sean. You look busy. Definitely. <laughs> Always do with a hand. Us. She's a beautiful looking boat. What is she? She's a Ruby class lifeboat built in 1918. Probably the, the Rolls Royce of rowing lifeboats. The Robert and Ellen Robson is a 34 Ruby class boat made in London. She spent 39 years at sea in Ireland, Aberdeen, and then here in Whitby. But she was the last of a kind that demanded a lot more from her crew than today's lifeboats. She was the last pulling lifeboat in the RNLI fleet. So the last rowing boat in the RNLI was this boat in Whitby. Yes. Everywhere else they had motorised boats. That's correct. Wow. If only she could talk, she'd have some salty tales to tell. How effective was she? Did she save many lives? Um, in a short time at Whitby, she was used to, uh, on several rescues. Uh, one of the most more notable ones was when she rescued uh, 21 geology students from Edinburgh off the infamous Black Nab at just outside Whitby Harbour. Yeah. Uh, so she did what modern uh, inshore lifeboats did. She went inshore by the rocks and rescued uh, people that were cut off by the tide. Were they using a, a rowing boat ahead of a motorised boat because th she could get into the places that the motorised boat couldn't? That's correct. She could go right in on the rocks and there was no problem with the engine being caught on the, the, the kelp. Having a boat like this to see, I mean, that's quite a, a special thing, isn't it? Yeah, on the water, with fully crewed up, it's a lovely sight. Had a crew of 13 uh, and, the, you know, there were strong fishermen that, that knew how to row boats. As you're from Whitby, you'll know the story of Dracula and, and you'll know his boat ran aground just off the coast here. The Dimitri, yes. The RNLI, would they have saved Dracula? Uh, they didn't in the book, but, <laughs> but the RNLI would turn out and rescue anybody uh, in, during the Second World War. 
they, they rescued enemy pilots. They didn't turn around and come home. They rescued people. Mm. Yeah. It's taken me quite a while to do this little bit of the rudder. How long did it take you to restore this boat? We think we spent over 800 hours as a team on the boat uh, through the winter time in, in the tent, in the boatyard, in all conditions. The varnish had not been touched for uh, 25 years and the paint was peeling. It's a lovely boat and it didn't take that much effort to get it back, but we had to take all the paint off and take all the varnish off and then start again. What's the aim here? It's not to go in the water once we finish this rudder and the rest of it. Where is it going to go? We're restoring the museum, uh, which closed in September last year, and uh, the, the museum will be open to the public from early July, um, to, so that members of the public will be able to come in and enjoy the sight of the boat. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit like a retirement home for the boat, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I guess one of the things with the RNLI is encouraging new people to become volunteers. So the role this boat will play is absolutely crucial, even if it's a young kid coming in to look around and think, God, one day I want to do that, or whether it's an adult, who could actually join up? The, the museum will, will have lots of aspects that getting people to get involved in joining the lifeboat crew and rescuing people. You're in the RNLI, you've, you've been on rescues before. Yes. What's the feeling like when you actually save someone who's in, in real trouble? It's difficult to put your finger on it, but when you come home, it's a job well done. I mean, they were made of tough stuff then, weren't they? If you're going out into tough seas when people were in trouble and you were rowing a boat, that's a big risk, isn't it? That's, you, you've got to have well, nerves of steel. The lifeboatmen were volunteers in those days, like they are now. And when the runes are sounded, they all turn out and still go out to sea in, in rough conditions to save lives. This brave and intrepid lady certainly deserves to hang up her oars and enjoy a peaceful retirement after her long service of saving lives. Whitby must be one of the most photographed towns in the UK.